you so much for uh, coming here, guys. <laughs> How many people came uh, to our first event Ooh. in June? Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's good. Did you guys like it last time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so Startup Grind is the largest independent startup community in the world. We have 600 plus chapters across the world uh, with 100, in 125 countries. And we nurture startup communities through events, media, partnerships, and such. We're excited to have Jules Sukabat. So this man <laughs> is incredible. Okay. <laughs> he is a personal mentor. So this is very special for me So um, to, to do this, because he's my mentor. He's my friend. And um, I've shared some personal stuff with him. He's been there for me when I needed it. So. Um, Thank so you. <coughs> he's Thank a father, you. entrepreneur, so uh, serial entrepreneur. So father, husband, he has successfully built multiple technology companies. He had uh, several exits. He's investor in um, companies as well. Film, we will definitely talk about that as well. Yeah. So. And he was part of the founding team of Order Dynamics, which was sold in 2013 and again acquired last year in November for $13.4 million. And he's currently running TerraVault, a boutique software development firm. And I'm so excited to have him here. So I'm going to have you get up on your feet and give a warm aloha welcome to our lovely guest, Jules Sukabat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, wow, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, what your parents did for a uh, living. Right. And so yeah, de definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had a little incident there. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I was, um, I'm Canadian, in case you don't know, eh? Um, I was born in, in Bangkok, but we immigrated into uh, Canada when I was really young, about seven years old. And uh, from there, I just went to school, you know, in Toronto, and um, started the the first businesses, the ones that failed to, in uh, Toronto. And then from there, we, we you know we tried our hand. To we went to Bangkok, lived in Bangkok for about three years, and and uh, a couple of other places. So yeah. What did your parents do for a living? My parents were bankers. They worked at the bank. They retired from the bank. Um, my father was in business as well, so he, he really helped me out, um, you know, during, during my startups and obviously he funded me and helped me, helped me, um, you know, learn all these lessons right along the way. So they're bankers and, and finance. Okay. So were you always an entrepreneur? Any early um, signs of entrepreneurship you cool. want to share? So, um, high school. So I noticed that in high school, this is this is before Facebook and before cell phones. So you'd have to talk to people face to face and if you had a product to sell, it was all face to face transactions. So I would know some other friends from other high schools and some of them had, you know, they had like a hookup for like sunglasses or, or like designer neckties. So I went to an all boys school, we had to dress up in a blazer. And you know, I, I would, I would get the products from them, put them in my knapsack and set up shop at the lunchroom, you know, just to, just to make some lunch money. So it was first just a little, you know, a little hobby. And then eventually teachers were buying from me as well as the students. And then I started to like try to find other different things that people wanted. Uh, you know, it came to a point people were actually looking for custom products and I would be finding it from other, other sources. So that's what I realized. I, I really loved sales. Like I really loved um, business. And what I loved about it is that I could see the fruits of my labor instantly. Like because you sell the product and you see the the the, the funds that, that were made, and instantly, you know, I could do things with it. Like go out and watch movies and date. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, so what did you go to school for business or? Um, in high school, I took uh, math and sciences, like, like most Asian students. 
And so I was supposed to be a doctor, like most Asian students. Um, so I took nursing, actually. Okay. I went into nursing. Uh, I didn't get the right grades to get into um, uh, pre-med. So basically, I wanted to be a, like a nurse anesthetist. But when I, when I went in there the first year, it's, it's, it wasn't for me. Like, it's a very tough job. And I realized I, I want to go into business. Like I want to take that career. So it's one of those moments where I remember sitting, you know, putting the scrubs on, and it was like the fifth or sixth day at, at the hospital, and I was like, I'm gonna quit. Like uh, I'm gonna tell my wife, and you know, I'm gonna do it. And I literally just quit like that that semester. So nursing, imagine. <laughs> so <laughs> what was the transition like when you? So you wanted to be a nurse. But now you're an entrepreneur. Oh boy! How how did your first business start? So, um, so I had quit ner the nursing program. So so now I'm out of the job, and um, at that point in in my life, I, I had a son. I was really young, got married, had a son at 19, and I was into this uh, extreme sports games like paintball. So. Right away, I wanted to turn that into a business. So I started to explore ways of creating a retail store, you know, setting up a, a paintball uh, field and an indoor field. And that's exactly what I did. So that same year that I dropped out, that I started a retail paintball store, took a loan, um, and then we had a paintball field as well, indoor field. So uh, why paintball? So. <laughs> So I used to play it for fun. Most people know paintball is more a recreational uh, game, uh, but there's also a league. There's a professional league and there's an amateur league. So at that time, I was playing in the amateur league. So, you know, like full sponsorship. You get the whole gear, you get flights, and you um, you literally just go in the woods and just pretend you're a kid again. So, and yeah, and you get prizes and money and sponsorship. So, you got sponsorship? Yeah, we got sponsorship. You, you know, you get gear. You get products, and then th that's from, so from those suppliers, they're the ones that help supply the retail store. And then, you know, they set me up with terms on, on products and inventory, and then that's how it all started. Where was that business, and what happened uh, to Toronto. it? Toronto. Okay. Um, it, it, it imploded. <laughs> um, so so it's, in, it's Toronto, and uh, we had the retail shop. You know, I, I learned so many lessons on the cost of running a retail store. Um, the field, you know, lasted for quite a while. I think it was probably over a year. Uh, but at, at that time, I wanted to expand, so I got like overly ambitious. And I, I wanted to expand in Asia. Asia was developing, you know, you heard about the, the Asian tigers and all the mega trends, Asia books, and I was ready to go. So packed up, ready to go, uh, distributing, you know, these products. So that's exactly what happened, left. Uh, tried to build uh, this the business, same type of business, in um, in uh, in Bangkok, in Thailand, and then you know I I had a hard lesson on the market. Like, what is the market? What's the market size? How many customers? So there wasn't really enough to sustain okay. the type of model in North America. So yeah, so that's the that's the evolution of that. I'm not in that business anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Did you stay in Bangkok? What, what else did you do there? Like uh, so we, we were fortunate to, to be able to meet a few um, people. So in, in, the, in the paintball world in, in, um, in, in Thailand, it's quite a, like a luxury like sport, right, a recreation. So we were fortunate to meet a lot of people in, in, in business, in, um, in entertainment. And I pretty much just hung out with a, a lot of those people. And um, you know, one thing led to another. We opened a restaurant um, in 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 Bangkok, and um, I helped create the concept with the partners. And then I also uh, uh, shortly after sold sold that business to the to one of the uh, one of the founders, and they continued that business for another ten years. The restaurant business. The, the restaurant business. So, and also, I was able to start a web development company there, a web design company. So this is like way back. I think it's 1997. This is when there was brochureware. This is before you know, again, Facebook. And so we had we had 
ICQ chat and FTP, right? And we're on dial-up modems. So the trend was people were having these websites to you know, introduce their business and their services. It wasn't you know, online banking, right? So we opened up a, a, an office to, to get a lot of work from Europe and North America. And every time we got one job, we just grew. We grew to 25 employees. I was in my 20s. Um, that was amazing. Like I started with, I got a loan from my dad to buy a laptop. And I started with a laptop, 1000 bucks. Wrote the first proposal on Microsoft Word, got the five grand contract, put three employees, and just kept going. So that was a, an amazing um, experience. So what happened after? So um, after about three years, my wife and I, we wanted to move back to North America for personal reasons. So I had exited my investment positions to the founders and paid off my, you know, my loans to my family and uh, went back to Toronto. So I, you know, I was so excited about technology. Um, the market in Asia was a bit different at that time. I don't know if you know there was a currency devaluation across all of Asia. Everything imported became twice the price. So um, technology was coming up. This was probably before the 2000 crash <laughs> of, um, of the stock market. So I I'd went back to Toronto to learn all the other back-end stuff, like how do you make a website? How do you create an intranet? You probably don't know that word, but intranets were the apps <laughs> that you guys are using now. They were called like intranets. <laughs> so, yeah. So what really made you go for it? Because you've, you've had... Oh, that's such a hard question there. <laughs> you've had a lot of exits, and your life took a different turn. Like, what was the driving force? So there's... That question is like an evolution, like every single, like it's phases, right? So it's, it's really why, why, do, why am I doing this, right? At a young age, as I mentioned, I, I got married. My wife is here actually. Um, we, have, we had our first son when we were 19 years old and I was in high school. And so what made me go for it was just this, this like desire to just provide a a better life for my family, like to put food on the table. Um, I was young, uh, didn't have a university degree, so I was, you know, always competing with, uh, with other, other, other people for jobs. And it's just entrepreneurship was that, that hope, you know, that, that I had. I, I do remember one thing too. Uh, I went out of the, there's a nightclub in Toronto, and I went out of the nightclub, and there was this gentleman in a Porsche. And I, I love the car, and I just asked him, I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a businessman. And I said, that's what I'm doing. So tell us about, so you, you started um, Wrap It Up Bangkok, then WebWorks, which you sold to your partners, then Bagna Networks? Yes, the network. Uh, yeah, network so how did apps. that start? Oh, so I, I was working at a recruiting firm in, in network technology, so I got my education, did my night school classes, and um, I, I ended up being the network operations manager of, of the company. And I started to realize this was the time when there were, so SaaS companies were called ASP, application service providers, and that whole industry was, was growing. And so we had this product like a monster.com, like a job board, and our whole department was managing this one hosted system, you know, along with the internal network. And, and I was doing the math of, of the team, and I was like, this is pretty expensive. <laughs> like, at some point, um, we might get fired. Right? <laughs> so, so my partner and I, who happens to be my, my we, like, we were, I was a network operators manager, he was a network administrator. We d devised this plan where we said, why don't we just pitch the same company get them as a client, manage the system, and I'll just walk myself out of the job first, right? So that's exactly what happened. So I, we got the contract, I lost my job, um, but in, in the model that we had, the managed service model, is that we would just get a data center, we would host the system, and all we needed was two clients to be back you know, on our feet. So that's exactly what we did. We found another client, and then we kept growing and growing, and then we ended up having, you know, two full like racks in, in New York and one in Toronto. 
and we were doing that and just growing it. And at that time, this is before it's hard to paint the world at that time. So it's like there, there wasn't there wasn't Amazon Web Services. There there like Rackspace wasn't really around. So you could buy servers from eBay, put them up, and put you know like all the other. Um, network devices, and then you would manage, like literally, you would charge clients like thousands to manage that, right? Because we had the certifications on how to how to use that technology. So that was the model. And what happened to that business? Uh, we sold that. That was actually my first real exit, like with you know proper legal documentation and face-to-face -face negotiation. So we sold that to Canada Web Hosting. Um, they were mainly in um, BC. They wanted to move into the facility in Toronto. And so they acquired our book of business, our equipment, our assets. And um, as part of the deal, my partner stayed for, I think, a good three years to build the office up. And it's still up and running. It's called Tenzing. I think they just rebranded. Um, and they're global now, right? Wow. So yeah, that was... Uh, and then I actually joined him a year after. So uh, towards the end of, of, of our experience there, we were together again, just, uh, just um, selling e-commerce solutions, ironically. Yeah, why ironically? <laughs> so ironically, because um, that led to Order Dynamics. Yeah, let's, let's yeah, talk about Order exactly Dynamics. Yeah. So Order Dynamics is an e-commerce platform. And I had gotten into e-commerce the whole world of e-commerce through the acquisition. So Tenzing was actually, what they would do is they would host large retailers, websites, and, and platforms. So if you know the e-commerce world, if you bought IBM WebSphere or ATG um, software, you have to have your own servers. So again, you know, before Amazon Web Services, before Azure, right? So these these contracts and these services were, were quite large. They're, you know, they're over 10,000 a month just to build your own environment of production, pre-production. And I was selling those. Like I was a consultant to build that channel partner and par channel partnership. So I, I you know, successfully closed a few deals together. And, um, and then I found the the original, um, the original uh, uh, creators of Order Dynamics through that whole experience. And then from there, we partnered and started another company. So walk us through your, your, your entire journey with Order Dynamics. Oh, that's so. an amazing one. OK. So Order Dynamics, the two original co-founders of that product and company was actually my client at Banya Networks. So I didn't even know. Like all we see are just hardware servers. We don't know what's running on them. So this happened to be running on, you know, this one managed service contract we had. And so through the through the network of of you know like events like this, we just ran into the old client, had a chat. What are you guys up to? You know, it said what they're working on, and they're like, oh, remember that product that we have? Well, yeah, it's a you know we have some clients. You, you know, we should do something together. I was like, yeah, okay, sure. So a couple more meetings. We had, and then next thing we knew, we just rebranded, reformed a partnership, and then um, my partner and I again, who sold, we sold Benya Networks together, we paired up again, and we we um, we helped grow the business and for another four years after that. And you sold the company, and we sold that one. So what was the that experience one. like? Because that was your largest. That exit. was the largest one to date, for now. So. Um, <laughs> So that, what, what's it like? Oh man, it's, it's the most exciting thing ever. However, it's the saddest thing. So I say it's, it's a double-edged sword because there's the four years of building that company, like I remember everything. I remember all the trade shows, all the challenges, you know, when the flyers and giveaways weren't ready for the you know, $20,000 booth. Like every single problem that ever happened that, we overcame all the vendors, all the clients. Um, the sad part is when you sell a company, it's no longer your company, right? Depending on the deal, if you fully exit and walk away. So all those memories, it hits you after, it hit me after. It only hit me like a year after. 
that, oh, this is all going to end at some point, and I have to find someone else, like something else, and, and um, some you know, other group of partners to, to, to go build another business. So that's the sad part. And the exciting part is you, you get to do some of the things that, that you, you've been putting off. So we had, we had plans to travel. I had plans to you know, I have a shopping list like a, you know, that gets accumulated through 20 years. And suddenly you're like, oh, let's just buy this and see what happens. And so that's the exciting part. You get to actually do all that, right? So you sold order dynamics, and um, so you talked about some of the challenges. Do you do, do you want to walk us over that? And oh, okay. Um, which one specifically? <laughs> so with order dynamics, like you mentioned something with the trade shows, and the, you know. So oh, the the biggest challenge in starting, uh, especially a technology company, for us is um, is sales, right? That's the challenge for everyone. So how, how we overcame that was, was through channel partners, right? Channel, partner, channel partnership strategy seems to be like my MO. It's the, it's the easiest thing for me. It's what I understand. And it, it works similar to, to my experience in, in the network company. So here we are trying to sell. How do you sell hardware to, to companies that just bought an e-commerce software? You know, so the answer is you partner with the e-commerce software company. Right or the systems integration company that sold them the e-commerce software. So you know, putting that hat on, we looked at order dynamics and, and we're like, well, how, how do we how do we get in there? How do we? So I had found um, old classmates of mine who had a security compliance company, and they had this really large retailer in Toronto that they were doing um, they were doing credit card like PCI certification and you know through their through their discovery they found out that they have to be compliant for their e-commerce and their platform wasn't and right away like when I when I spoke to them about that they they literally just helped me get the meeting in fact the initial product demo we didn't even have an, an office at that point right the initial the initial product demo was done at at my 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 high school friends um, office and um, you know we, we just did the whole the whole thing and got the deal and that deal just it changed everything and then from there we just uh, we, um, we we attended trade shows so the other challenge to get sales is we went to the trade shows where all the brands and retailers were and we set up shop and we do the demos we set up a booth and then from there, um, we were able to get more leads for that year, and I think we closed four or five, you know, enterprise deals that that <coughs> second year, and just kept repeating it until, until we exited four years later. So, what did you do after? Um, after you sold the company. Oh man, I, I I went a bit crazy, so I I, I bought some things, that I thought would make me happy, <laughs> so I. I, lo I love cars. Um, since I was 18, I wanted a Porsche, so I bought, you know, my favorite Porsche 911, and then I, I ended up buying three of them, <laughs> um, and I, I sold them all just last like, two years ago. But it was it was fun. Like I went there, I got it, I, I owned it, I drove it. I you know we went out with friends, but I don't really remember like. My memory of those cars were more of my times driving with friends. I remember what we spoke about, um, you know, just just where we went, what we talked about. But um, but the 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 memory of those cars that wasn't so special is the, the ownership of all these things. Like all these things are just. There's a there's a responsibility factor factor to a lot of these things and. That's what I discovered, and so I realized that where I where I'm happy the most is is when I'm building companies, when I'm when I'm going through these like experiences because I'm, I'm creating something, I'm you know I'm getting out there, I'm challenged, right? So so what we did after that was um, we worked with more companies after that. So there's two, three companies um, that I personally invested in. Uh, one of them I, I exited 
uh, last year. It's called Shift Ventures. They have, um, they're in the electronic cigarette business with e-liquids. And so um, there's a good story to that. I had a failed business in that area. Uh, I tried to do an e-commerce website for e-cigarettes. I failed spectacularly. I think I lost like 35,000 or something. But that opened the door to, to the investment opportunity with this other company. And so immediately in 2015, I was able to, to invest in, in this other successful um, business. And, uh, and then shortly after, uh, they cashed out the first round of investments within like nine months. And then I was able to invest the second time and then also help them grow as a management consultant uh, globally. So like, you know, that's, we did that. FilmDo is another video um, platform, video on demand, stream, streaming platform. And then also um, uh, Von Bismarck, which is uh, called uh, the Mall X. They have a marketplace on the Xbox to sell hard good products. And now they're working on a loyalty coin for gamers. So, you know, I just met these entrepreneurs. One is in Dublin, one is in London. And then uh, we had a lot of meetings, you know, due diligence. It looked like a good product. I partnered up with other angel investors who have also exited, um, like larger than I have. And you know, we just came together and, and, and put seed capital, and we're just helping these entrepreneurs you know, go, go through the journey. So when, when startup, startups come to you and they want to raise money, what is the first advice you, you'll give them? Should they raise money in the first don't, place? Don't raise money. <laughs> so the, if you're in a startup stage, like. You're, if you raise capital, especially if you do it through equity financing, sell your shares for cash, the valuation of your company is low at that point. So you end up giving up quite a lot, right? So I, I always say, if you can fund it yourself through a part-time job or you know, working with your partner, um, your business partners or your spouse, then you can grow it to a certain point where you have a product. Because if you're raising capital at later stages, when your company is more valued, then you're giving up less equity. And partners and investors, you know, that's, entrepreneurship is really not like, like owning your own business and being your own boss. Like, your boss is your clients. You have investors, that's another dynamic um, thrown into the mix, right? So my, I always say don't raise capital if you don't need it. It only makes sense if you're, if you're multiplying your sales, right? So the example that I can give you um, is Order Dynamics. So Order Dynamics sold again, 2018 in November. This is public information. So it said that, so a publicly traded company purchased them for about 13.4 million. Order Dynamics at that time had seven million in sales and its profit was minus two million. So that would mean that it's, it, it spends nine million to get seven million in sales, and it was sold for about two times, right? Um, top line sales. So if you're going to borrow five hundred thousand to get to a hundred, like sorry, to get to a million in sales, you're you've just added two million to the value of the company, right? So depending on how much equity you gave, the math might make sense, right? So that's when I say that's the best time to raise funds when you're accelerating your sales growth. Um, what are some of the things that, what are some things not to do oh. as an entrepreneur? Because you mentioned some of the failures and... Um, some things not to do. Oh. oh let's, uh, cash flow I think was one of the ones yeah, cash flow. So cash flow. So one of the big things for entrepreneurs is to really manage the cash flow, right? So I learned this lesson with the retail store. What I was doing was um, I would be selling the products, so all the products on the shelf. You know, you have X amount of inventory. Once the product sh uh, sells, you're supposed to re reinvest in inventory, and then the profits are paying operational costs. If you're not watching that properly, a lot of the inventory capital gets spent on operations until your shelves get dry. And that's exactly what happened. There was a point where 
There was no more capital. I was using it for operations. There's nothing in the store, and then no one comes to it. And then instantly you close, right? So that's one thing. So the same analogy for technology companies, right? It's like um, if, if, you're, if you're not selling the managed service fees or the SaaS fees, then, then how are you funding your operation costs, right? So usually it's by raising money, right? So I, I always, the lesson learned is really build the business so that there is, you know, uh, um, sales, so that there are validating clients that are paying for your service that have said, yes, I think it's worth this much and, 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 and we'll pay you for it. So that, 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 watching that is still important in any business. Um, unless you, you, know, you were heavily funded and you, and you were just trying to get clients and paying for clients, like investing into clients, so then your value of the, the company is based on how many clients you have that are either paying for your operation costs or not, right? So that it all depends on what type of business that, um, you have and how heavy are you funded. Yeah, so that's one lesson learned. And uh, you talked about cash flow. Cash how, flow. how to create cash flow as a startup. How to create cash flow. And manage um, cash flow. So I, how to create cash flow. So it's through channel partners. Like, so I mentioned those strategies. Like when I'm work, when I'm working on a new startup, um, you know, let's say, let's say I want to sell this new software that that that, that I have. Um, I'm always looking at what revenue streams are out there. So for Order Dynamics, we had an e-commerce platform, but we did we also had an order management system. So later on, after a year or so, we realized people were asking us, because of our name, are you an order management system? And we didn't know that there was a gap in this market where you could buy a really high-end enterprise system that doesn't have order management. So we ended up being like a part of our software, ended up connecting with all these other bigger e-commerce um, uh, systems. So what, what, I, what I do with the team is that we look at all the different revenue streams and how we can actually build them out. And that was one of them that wasn't there. So the more revenue streams you have, the more chances of success you have. Because people might not buy what you thought the product was. They're buying it for your order management. And then suddenly that becomes another line item, right? So looking at that really helps um, map the cash flow to your operations, right? So what is the operation cost that lines up with that, with that uh, revenue stream? So yeah, that's one strategy, yeah. So tell us about now. So you Walk us through um, why you're in Hawaii. <laughs> what is Terra Vault? Okay. So um, Terra Vault. So as you mentioned, we're a, we're a boutique software development firm. Last year in October, we partnered with um, High Tech Kui. They're on the island, and they uh, they do cybersecurity. So they have a lot of big um, uh, clients um, on the mainland. And you know, through a couple of conversations that we had. They, they had a couple of clients that needed help with their software projects. And so, you know, as entrepreneur as I am, I'm like, can you get me a meeting? You know, I'd love to have a chat. So I was able to um, have a couple conversations and, um, and then, you know, we ended up just working together. So channel partner strategy again. <laughs> it's High Tech Hui's clients. And um, we're helping them with some of their software projects in Honolulu. So let's jump into rapid fire. So, oh. <laughs> okay. So we, we do a 21 questions rapid fire. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just, just one word answers. Yes. Okay. I mean, if you want to take your time, I, okay. let's do one word or <laughs> short answers. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Oh, none. 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 Okay. None. Uh, beer or wine? Cider. <laughs> Cider. Apple. Uh, sushi or tacos? Sushi. Favorite app? Favorite app? My banking apps. <laughs> All of them. All of them? Because I worked in that industry, right? Because I did the, yeah, so, but I love them. 
backing Any up. Any favorite one? Um, the my main accounts to pay bills. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> favorite OS? <sighs> Mobile or uh, general? Well, Windows. Yeah, we right? disagree with on that. <laughs> Windows, yes. and um, I'm on Apple, but Android I might go back to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, favorite holiday? Christmas. Okay. <laughs> I think we all know this. Favorite car? Porsche 911. <laughs> <laughs> favorite vacation spot? Hawaii. Oh, wow. Okay. Favorite book? Oh, come on. What category? Maybe pick three. three. So okay, so business, ca so Cash Flow Quadrant, one of the best books I've read in my twenties. MBA Guide, the Portable MBA Guide to Entrepreneurship, I think the best reference book for business. And um, favorite book right now that I'm reading is Start with Why. Start with Why. Uh, favorite movie or TV show? Top Gun. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> Favorite artist, music. Oh, my daughter, Naya Riley. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> <laughs> On Spotify. <laughs> uh, your go to karaoke song? The one from Top Gun. Okay. The slow one when they do the. How does it go? What, you never <laughs> close your eyes. Every <laughs> um, anything you collect oh man um, I used to collect model cars before I could buy the real one <laughs> so these are the really you know high detail 118th model I had like I think I have 40 um, and I would look at them right I just enjoy them in the office and then and then when you know, then I bought them. So cars, model cars. cars. And bikes. And bikes, bicycles. Bi bicycles. Yeah, I'm into bikes now. OK, awesome. Uh, any unusual skills or talents? I used to dance Hawaiian all the way till I was 13. So that's I unusual. did not know that. No one knows There's that. No one knows that. So I would dance modern, Tahitian, ancient, till I was up, till, till I was 13. Your top strength in business? I would say networking, just like interpersonal. And I didn't know that was a strength, but I found that helped a lot, just networking. What was your first job? I drove, I delivered computers. Before, way back then, before Dell was invented, there was, you know, you would make these 386 computer clones. And I had, I knew somebody who was making them for a company. And I would deliver them between, um, I would be delivering them between Toronto and uh, like Kingston, like a two hour drive. And so that was my first job I remember. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Race car driving. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what is the best compliment someone can give you? Thank you for helping me. Like meaning, you know, something I said to them or helped them with really made a difference in their life. Uh, a cause you are passionate about. Hmm. Right now, it's it's renewable energy. So I, I I have another thing I collect, electric bikes. So I'm really like <laughs> into electric bikes, and I find that so fascinating. So I really want to get the electric sc scooter now. So I'm 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 all about that type of transportation and commuting. Do you like Tesla? I like my bike better <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, 
Who are five people alive or dead you would want to have dinner with? Oh, wow. Okay. <sighs> Jay Z? Napoleon Hill? Um, that's a tough one. Two more? Three more? I'm blank on that. I'm blank on that. Okay. Any entrepreneur that? Oh yeah, all of them. Like every one of them. <laughs> like that's a. I thought it's a given. I know all of them. Okay. Um, one thing on your bucket list. Race car driving. <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> who played the activity? Uh, we had a, okay, people played, maybe one or two people, <laughs> looks like it, okay. Maybe we should remove it for next event because it doesn't look like oh, a lot of people like this, but anyway. Um, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, what important truth do very few people agree with you on? I would say the bubble of everything. So what I mean by that, it's a very controversial subject I'm going to go there. I really think everything's a bubble right now. Every single asset class, everything that's going on, that's my theory. Um, and I'm st I believe that. So I, what I mean by that is the stock market is overinflated. Housing prices are overinflated. You have art that is, you know, people are buying like Banksy for two million. Like it, you know, there's a lot. There's like even like stencil art that gets multiple like copy that's going for hundred like there's a there's a bubble of everything um even with startups yes i mean so there's a great there's a great actually a great um report called the uh, software equity group they write this report on the valuation of companies and so just just to let you know like a SaaS company right now publicly traded is roughly valued at um, 6.9, seven times top line sales with or without profit. So every million dollars that they have in sales, they're worth seven million with no profit even. So I feel that's, you know, that's it's a good environment for people to create um, good software companies that, you know, that make revenue and hopefully are are profitable, but I, I think there's a bit of a bubble in the market. Okay. Thank you so much, Jules. So we're going to open it, open it up for questions. Yep. Um, so I, I think we spoke a while ago about uh, going back to Bangkok. Um, if you were to do that, I'm really curious on what you would do in Bangkok. And, and if you were to advise someone to go to Bangkok and do a creative business, I thought about that last night, yeah. and I thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so you know, I don't. I went to. I went there recently, two years ago. There's um, there's there's a company that I knew that I know from London that set up shop there. They just got bought. It's like a dual screen um, TV. So there's like you know you have your mobile and then you have your TV, and they sold for ten times um, uh, the investment. So incredible developers out there. There's a whole network of even uh, investment capital. Um, you know, in those areas, you have a lot of problems you can solve. Transportation, traffic, pollution, housing. You know, you can have container homes if you wanted. You can make them even renewable with solar. Like, I would do that. Or even do an eco-tourism, um, right? Have a, have, buy some property you know, in the jungle, set up. That's the kind of stuff I would do, right? Are you going to go back? You know, I haven't spoken to my wife yet, but <laughs> since you've already mentioned that, <laughs> I, I, would go, I would go anywhere in this world. There's, it's, there's so much to do. There's so much to experience, and that's what I learned in Order Dynamics. After, after the sale, we literally just, you know, looked at each other one day, and we're like, 
wow, let's just, let's just go for it. <laughs> Sold our house, packed it up, right? And then we just, you know, just travel. Amazing, amazing question. So, order dynamics. Um, so we, we had set up the company for an exit. So all the documentation, getting all that ready, and um, there's this there's this I wouldn't say technique, but there's an industry there's these industry reports. If you get on an industry report that reviews your product, as like oh if you want to buy you know CRM software, here's the Gardner Magic Quadrant. If you get on those reports, on average, it's eight months before you're acquired. So we got on one of those reports, and within eight months, we got acquired. And what that process is, is potential buyers come to you, depending if you have an investment bank or somebody that's helping you. In our case, we just got recommended from the network, and the phone calls came in. And you know, at first, we're like, oh, who are these people? You know, like We brushed it off a few months, and then Later on, they bought us tickets to go to London. And these people, if you look at the list, they're probably the most respectable group um, and successful group of, of, of VCs. It's Frog Capital, ePlanet, West Coast Capital. Um, it's, you know, I think it's GP Bullhound is their name. These are all backed by um, really, really successful entrepreneurs, and, and their, their check sizes are double-digit millions, right? So, um, so we didn't know that. Like we, when, we didn't know that when we first got the offer. It got more exciting when, I think it got really more exciting when I met my first billionaire. And it was, you know, in his flat in London. We asked a few questions, you know, he answered a few questions, and that's when I Googled him, and I was like, Wow, this is serious. And then from there, it was like, you know, then it's six months, you get a term sheet. So the term sheet is just what you agree on in general before it's the deep dive of the due diligence. So once you see the term sheet, there's, there's a number and a sort of you know, value. And then after that, you pretty much, okay, now let's look at what's under the hood, right? So they do the code review. Is it your software? Is it real? What is behind the, the um, you know, the servers? And then there's this one document called uh, reps and warrants, <laughs> representations and warrants. What are you claiming is yours? What are you claiming that we don't know? So that's a very important document. And then once you get through all that, then the rest is more legal. And then that's when the lawyers just sort of negotiate. Um, all the deals. The only two big deals that I got into, it included an earnout. So you, usually you get one fee, and then there's another fee after two years or so. In this case, it's two years. The other one's three. So the earnout is nice because it's uh, I call it like you know going away goodbye time because you're sort of like psychologically winding down your ownership of the company and your. I, I was transitioning all, you know, my knowledge to, to the teams, the teams overseas, and so you know that was actually that was probably one of the most amazing times. So with with um, with Banyan Networks, when we went to Canada Web Hosting during our two to three year earnout, that's when we got involved in the e-commerce right net network and, and the space, and that's how we found Order Dynamics. With um, Order Dynamics, I had started to do a lot of work in Europe. So, you know, I remember these like red eye flights all across the pond. And then, you know, I'm up at nine o'clock, like just wired. And I have to do a full like, solutions presentation day with a client, right? So, you, you, like, you, like, I'm the one presenting. So, those, the stuff that I learned from that with, with the teams. And working with a bigger company that had 275 employees was just like next level. I was fortunate to to be um, I reported into the COO, who um, has many successful exits, 
and he actually became my mentor. In fact, he's actually a co-investor in all of those businesses, all the startups that I got involved in after. So just, just that experience is, is, is worth it. And at the very end, when you finish successfully, that's when you get your last check. And then that's when the regret, the regret set, sets in. You, you buy a Porsche, but you realize you know, there's no happiness in that either. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you learn you learn the laws of diminishing returns. Joel, I just want to preface this saying thank you for coming out here tonight. Oh, thanks, um, man. Also, want to say thank you for something you said to me last time at the last startup. You helped me eliminate some excuses around pursuing one of my endeavors to do, uh, put out an album eventually. Good for you, so, man. Awesome question. So um, it, it really starts with, like for me, like now that I'm reading that, start with why. <laughs> what are the reasons you want to be an entrepreneur, right? It, it could simply be, you know, to create a better life for yourself and, and, and experiences and, and opportunities, right? So for me, like I have a family. Um, I love the opportunities that they have. I love the things that they're trying, they're going for. Um, how you eliminate that is it's a lot of there's a lot of personal and professional development courses out there they're all great um they all teach you know one there's a few basic things in there the most basic thing there is commitment right at some point you just make a commitment so at some point you know i say i'm going to commit to this venture and every single you know obstacle that's thrown at me and I can list a, a whole bunch of them once that commitment is made in my mind after I map it back to why I'm doing this um, then everything's clear right it's not to say don't quit at things like I, I fail so many times and I quit so many times and you just got to fail fast quit fast and then really go for the things that you you believe in that, that you feel you could drive forward. And I, I feel it's commitment is, is that word that, that I'm looking for. Like once you just commit, you make all the right decisions, right, around that. Thank you. One question. Yeah, go for it, sorry. Are you using the word exit as sort of interchangeable, or are you? Um, like, oh, most people don't understand beautiful. Beautiful. So um, I've, I fail a lot. Every year I fail in a, at least one business that I'm trying to build. And, you know, it's, it's quite a few thousand. I just try different things. And failure is not really a failure, right? So I mentioned the opportunity that I got to invest in and shift ventures. Like that's, I actually, a year before that, I tried my hand in e-commerce. So here I am, you know, I have an e-commerce platform. I really never had an e-commerce site. So I was like, oh, maybe I can do that too, right? But it's a very different world. So this is like generating traffic to your site, converting that traffic, so increasing traffic, converting traffic as customers. I didn't get that formula right. I, I, I still don't even know that formula. And so failing in that business really helped me understand that, that world. But when, when other, I had known this, this other group of um, co-founders of, of Shift Ventures, they had, they had like observed what I was sort of doing and then they're like, oh, you were in that space. Do you, wanna, do you wanna help expand our product globally? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? Well, we want you to go all over the world and, and sell the products, you know, to online stores, <laughs> to retailers, to distributors. And, and so sure enough, I was like, okay, got the investment opportunity, I invested, and I, I got a management consulting opportunity out of that. And, from there, I went to see Bahrain. I went to London, Germany. You know, like try driving a Porsche in Germany. Like it's supposed to be there, right? Versus 50 miles an hour. 
so like all of these things, like the, 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 these are the, uh, they're not failures. It, they're just, they just open doors to other things. And what I try to look for is what is the lesson I learned? Like, did I not pay attention to cash flow? Did I not pay attention to channel partners, right? You know, what, what did I miss in this whole equation? And I just try to work it better. Hi. Last question. Yes. Um, so was that your first trade show? For um, no, like uh, all the businesses, I go to the trade show of the industry. So mm -hmm. once you identify the target audience yes. of your product, mm -hmm. you find out where they hang out. So when you went to the trade show, at what uh, technology, technology readiness level, at the uh, investment readiness level, you were, did you have a pilot project running? You have a market product and then you went to a trade show? That's a great question. So we had we had just the one enterprise client. Okay. So here are here we are in order dynamics. We just closed the one big remember this was it was like a custom made e commerce product for um, you know a small group of, of customers. And so we just got this big client, we just onboarded them, and the whole demo was really around all the features and functions that supported um, that platform and so I use this word called vignettes it's they're like short stories so you want to queue up your little short stories and keep them in in your little like note so when a, a potential customer comes or a partner you're picking one of those little vignettes oh um, you want to do pick pack and ship oh here's how we've done it for this client right oh you want to do click and collect okay so here's what we've done and it's all vignettes, like little short stories where you can point. They're almost like mini case studies. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you're ready to, to demonstrate the product and you actually have referenceable clients, that's when you should go to the trade shows. I see. And putting 20,000 for a trade show um, and you had only one client, sounds like you put a lot of cash flow Emphasis. to the trade show. So um, that's a that's a good comment. So, so what the first year trade show was literally five foot booth. That's all we can afford. Okay. It was a table with a black cloth on it. And it was, you know, your fold out Velcro wrap. That kit is probably 500 bucks. And the booth was only 5,000. So that's the first trade show. Okay. Every year as you get more clients, <laughs> your booth gets bigger, right? until you become like Oracle and have a massive booth, right? So it's the evolution, right? And then even location. We didn't get the best traffic on the floor. We just got a little corner, right? You know, and so it, my, my, my recommendation is invest what you think your return is. So we had a calculate, like our, our platform was, was in the enterprise level, so, so we just needed one client, and that first month payment pays the whole bill, right? In fact, we got 64 leads in the first year. We closed four. I still remember that number because those clients are qualified. They're at the trade show. They're looking for whatever service you have or product, and, it's, and you're, you're literally having, you're having condensed conversations and more of them in a, in, in a weekend, right? And so I recommend really finding those trade shows um, and uh, it, it I mean it, it doesn't work for it might not work for B2C but the stuff that I was involved in is more B2B yeah. selling to doctors I was at trade shows for another company for that selling to um, brands and manufacturers uh,